Get your free copy of the complete tutorial at www.teachucomp.com forward slash free. Sage 50's inventory features track the goods and services that your company purchases and sells to others. As you make inventory related transactions, Sage 50 posts the information to the general ledger and adjusts the quantities and costs of goods accordingly. The first step in the process is to add the items that you will need to track into Sage 50. As you add items, you can change the default information that you set up within the inventory item defaults as needed. To add inventory items, just select Maintain from the menu bar, and then choose the Inventory Items command to view the Maintain Inventory Items screen. Notice that there are five tabs into which you enter information in this window. General, Custom Fields, History, Bill of Materials, and Item Attributes. You begin by assigning each item an item ID. You then enter a short description for the item into the Description field. Next, you'll select an item class from the drop-down list. Note that every item will fall into one of the classes that are defined. Item classes define the type of item that you are creating. They determine how an item's costing information is recorded. Once you save an item as a class of item, you cannot change the item class. Let's look at the different classes of items that you can create within the Maintain Inventory Items screen. So first you have stock items, and you use this class to track traditional inventory items. When you create an item as a stock item, Sage 50 tracks the quantity, average cost, related vendors, stock reorder point, and quantity on hand. You can also create a master stock item. This is a special class of stock item that contains attribute information about several types of substock items contained within it. You can go here to maintain the substock, as you cannot directly change the substock records within the Maintain Inventory Items screen. You also have non-stock items, and you use this for items that you sell but don't place into inventory. Sage 50 doesn't track the quantity on hand for these items, and there's no associated costing method. You can also create a description only. This is used for line item comments within an invoice. Nothing about this is tracked. You can also choose a service class, and you use this class to represent services you apply to your salary and wages account. This is useful for services provided by your employees, and you can enter a cost for the service. You can also create labor as a class in order to use this class item to represent labor that you apply to your salary and wages account. And this is useful for labor provided by subcontractors, and you can enter a cost for this labor. You can also create items of the assembly class, and you use this to represent items in your inventory that can be assembled or disassembled from the other stock items within your inventory. You also have activity items in Sage 50 Complete or higher, and you use this item class to indicate how time is spent when performing services for a customer. They are used in employee or vendor time tickets when you plan on billing customers for activities performed by employees or vendors as subcontractors. Finally, you have charge items, once again in Sage 50 Complete and higher only. As you use this item class to identify reimbursable charges incurred when performing services for a customer. These are used in employee or vendor time tickets when you plan on billing customers for reimbursable expenses through expense tickets. Now when you create an item, we'll take a sample item from the sample company here. On the general tab, you'll just enter the specific information for each item. Now, depending on the class of the inventory item, here we have a stock item as an example, note that some fields may or may not be available on the general tab. You also enter the beginning balances for inventory items on this tab as well. Now, first off, in the description field, you use the drop down to select either for sales or for purchases. You can enter two descriptions per item, one which appears within your sales forms, 
and one which appears within your purchase forms. Next, enter the price of the item into the price level field. For your stock and assembly class items, enter the last purchase price paid for the item. Now once a beginning balance or transaction is entered that uses this item, this field will be updated by Sage 50. For your non-stock, service, and labor class items, enter the cost of sales amount that should be posted when the item is sold. Next, select one of the three available costing methods from the drop-down list of choices, FIFO, LIFO, or Average. Note that this value cannot be changed after the item has been saved, and it will only be available for stock and assembly class items. Continue on by entering the UPC or SKU code for the item. You can then select an item type of your choosing or enter a new code by hand. That value is used for filtering reports. You can enter a description of the item's physical location into the location field. Then enter how the item is sold in the stocking or unit of measure field. This is optional as it's never used in calculations. You can also enter a weight for the item. Weight totals can actually be printed on reports providing that you use the same unit of measurement for each item. Next, enter the income account that will be accredited when the item is sold in the general ledger sales account field. Enter the inventory account that will be debited when the item is bought and credited when it's sold into the general ledger inventory account field. You can then enter the expense account that will be credited when a non-stock item is sold in the general ledger salary or wages account field. This account will be reduced and the cost of sales account will be increased when a non-stock item is sold. For stock items, you can enter the cost of goods account that will be debited when the item is sold into the general ledger cost of sales account field. Next, select the item tax type from the item tax type drop-down. Finally, enter the minimum stock number into the field of the same name. This is the quantity at which you reorder the stock. It's used for stock and assembly items only. You can also enter the reorder quantity, which is the number of items usually purchased when the minimum stock level has been reached. Also, you can specify a preferred vendor for this item by using the preferred vendor ID box. If you have a buyer, you can specify the employee ID of the buyer by using the buyer ID field. When you're ready to enter beginning balances for your items, assuming that you are initially setting up your company file, you'll click the beginning balances arrow. We'll discuss this in a later section. For now, congratulations on getting through the general tab. Next, you'll click the custom fields tab. And here you'll enter any information for this item into the custom fields that you decided to create when you set the values within the Inventory Item Defaults window. Next, click the History tab. You can't make changes to this window, but it does show useful information. It will display the period history date, and for that date, the number of units sold, dollars in sales, number of units received, and the total cost for the selected item. For assembly items, you can select the Bill of Materials tab. Here you enter information about your assembly class items. If the item that you are creating is not of the assembly class, then you simply skip this tab. An assembly class item is a group of products that you sell as a unit. So to create an assembly item, you must select the required component items and enter the quantities needed of each into the Bill of Materials tab. If you want that item to make up an assembly to print as a separate line item within an invoice, then you would check the Print Components on Invoice checkbox. Otherwise, it will just print the description of the item. 
Next, you actually input the item ID of the first item that's used in the assembly by selecting it from the item ID column. Note that you can use any stock, non-stock, description, assembly, labor, or service item. Next, you would enter a short description for the item for reference into the description field. Next, you would type in the quantity needed of the item in order to build one of the assembly items. You can also use the add and remove buttons that appear on the right side of this tab to add and remove item components for an assembly item. Then repeat the process, making sure that you enter all of the items needed to create the assembly item. Now, if you're creating an item that is a master stock item, you would then click the item attributes tab. Now on this tab, you set the primary attributes and the secondary attributes for this master stock item that you are creating. These attributes could include things like size, style, and color, for example. As you set the individual attributes, Sage 50 will create substock items of every possible combination between your primary and secondary attributes. To enter your primary and secondary attributes, click into the name of the attribute that you want to set, for example, primary attribute, and then set an ID code by typing it into the ID field. Then type in a description for that attribute. Then simply click the Add button to add it into the list. Note that you can also select an attribute and click the Remove button to remove it from the list. Then in the Secondary Attribute section, repeat the process by entering the name of the secondary attribute to set. Then give the first specific instance of the ID code by typing it into the ID field, and then a description of the specific instance of the secondary attribute into the description field. Once again, click the Add button to add that attribute to the list of secondary attributes. Once again, you can also select an attribute from this list and click the Remove button to remove it. Now once you save a master stock item, Sage 50 will generate every possible combination of primary and secondary attributes as separate stock items, which are referred to as substock, and you will be able to see them within your item ID dropdown. The item ID of substock that's created is the combination of the ID code for the master stock item plus the ID code of its primary and secondary attributes. You cannot delete a substock item without removing its attribute ID, but if you select the actual master stock item, you can check the inactive checkbox for any substock item that is created in order to inactivate it. Just be sure that you click the Save button when you're done entering any new item information in order to save your changes. Now, to remove inventory items that you don't use, with the exception of substock as noted, you simply open up the Maintain Inventory Items list and select the inventory item that you would like to delete. Then simply click the Delete button to permanently delete it. Now, if you've used it in transactions, though, you must not delete it. You would have to make it inactive instead by selecting the checkbox for inactive that appears at the top of the window, and then clicking the Save button on the toolbar at the top of the window. Like what you see? Pick up your free copy of the complete tutorial at www.teachucomp.com forward slash free.